So this is week two in our month of, of interfaith diversity, and it's our, the fourth month in the whole year of diversity. The quote that we are using as the foundation for this entire month is from uh, Father Hans Kung. He said this, there will be no peace among the nations without peace among the religions. And there will be no peace among religions without dialogue among the religions. Here at Unity North, we have dialogues from different faith traditions. We began our journey last week as we had a conversation with a Sufi and a Baha'i and Unity. And we all drew bridges and, and made bridges and realized that, gosh, we call ourselves New Thought, but we're not really New Thought. We are merely Old Thought revisited. But we're going to even go back farther in time today. Last week was Baha'i and Sufi, and I had scheduled today to have somebody from the Sikh tradition to be here. Sikh, as we know it, but it's actually pronounced Sikh, Sikhism. And unfortunately, they weren't able to make it today. They're going to be here at the end of the month. So I asked uh, my good friend, Chika Barton, if she would pinch hit today. She was part of our month-long celebration of Black History Month. And during that time, Chika mentioned the subjugation, the, the erasing of African spirituality that happened in slavery. It was just pushed off to the side and subjugated and pushed, pushed away and long forgotten, but not long forgotten at Unity North. And so I called Chica at the last minute and said, can you sit in today for the, for the sick people? <laughs> Literally. And she absolutely emphatically said yes. So will you please welcome Chica Barton. And so we have the African tradition represented today, but we also have Himalayan tradition. And our resident expert, she doesn't call herself an expert, but I call her a scholar and an expert in Himalayan, Himalayan traditions, is the person you know very well as Reverend Avril, Avril Maynard. Uh, she is a font of wisdom. And she has said yes today too. And so I tell you, if I feel like there's two roses and a thorn up here, but uh, there's a lot of beauty up here today from the inside out and from the outside in. And so we thank both of you for being here. We thought it might be good to start the message portion of the day with a poem or a reading or a scripture from our various traditions. I will go ahead and go last and share a beautiful song by Daniel Neymar to represent unity. But right now, I invite you to open your heart to the language of three different traditions and allow it to steep and sit in your heart and in your spirit. The good is one thing the pleasant another. Both of these serving different needs bind a man, a human. It goes well with him who of the two takes the good, but he who chooses the pleasant misses the end. Both the good and the pleasant present themselves to a man. The calm soul examines them well and discriminates. Yea, he prefers the good to the pleasant, but the fool chooses the pleasant out of greed and avarice. From the Kata Upanishad. In the whispers of the wind, our ancestors speak. Their wisdom echoes through the edges, ages, strong and meek. In the dance of stars, their presence we find, a lineage of love forever intertwined. Through the veil of time, they guide our way. With gentle hands, they lead us to the light of day. In the depths of our soul, their essence resides, a sacred bond unbroken by earthly tides. With each breath we take, we feel their embrace, their spirits intertwined with ours in endless grace. In the depths of silence, their voices resound, a symphony of love in which we are found. For in the oneness of God, our souls unite, a divine connection burning ever bright. Through the tapestry of life, they walk by our side, our ancestors, our guardians, our eternal, eternal guide. 
One power, one power, one power. There's one power, it's invisible, yet we see it everywhere and every day. There's one power indescribable, yet we speak of it with every word we say. It's mysterious until you know the truth. It's as simple as the love inside of you. Call it God, call it Spirit, call it Jesus, call it Lord, call it Buddha, Baha'u'llah, angels' wings or heaven's door. But whatever name you give it, it's all one power, can't you see? Whatever name you give it, it's the very air we breathe. It's the power of the love in you and me. One power, one power, one power. I invite you to sing those words with me. One power, one power. One power Call it God, call it Spirit Call it Jesus, call it Lord Call it Buddha, Baha'u'llah Angels' wings or heaven's door It's Muhammad, it's your mind It's your soul and it's your sign It's the universe, it's music Mother Earth and Father Time But whatever name you give it It's all one power, can't you see? Whatever name you give it It's the very air we breathe It's the power of the love In you and me Together, one power One power one power and so today we celebrate one power one power in through around and expressed as all creations as all people and as all religions and so we begin to build a bridge and i'm going to go first because these ladies have a lot to say and i want to get out of their way as quickly as possible so in unity we'll start with the unity movement we believe in the oneness of all creation duh that's our name, unity, right? That there's no person that's not part of a multicultural, a multi-layered, a multi-expressed, and multi-experienced singularity. It's often called God. That singularity is called God. But in unity, we call it love. We call it life. We call it light. We're less concerned about what you call it and more concerned that you have a relationship with it and with it as expressed as all creation. This love is known by many names. It's uh, experienced in many forms, but we believe in unity it is the single life-giving and life-sustaining energy that we all share. Everybody take a deep breath with me and let it go. That breath that you just took in and released is an expression of that God power, of that one power, of that one life force. And you give, uh, you give that life expression as many as 30,000 times a day. Take another deep breath let it go that's God that's God and you're giving God expression as much as 30,000 times a day we're all engaging in that same exercise conscious sometimes and unconscious at other times right though it can be unconscious this act is an act of energy being exchanged we have exchanged energy since the minute you came into this room in fact, you're exchanging energy with anybody who's been in this room for the last 25 years. You're exchanging energy with anybody who's walked the face of the planet with that breath. That breath itself is what we call God. And when we have thoughts, when we have feelings, and we have actions, they are carried out on the breath and exchanged on the breath 
and deposited into the one shared bank account of energy called life. We're creating a bank account called life. Some people in the unity movement call that collective consciousness. Every thought, every action, every feeling is being exchanged. Therefore, every expression is either benefiting or hurting the whole of creation. Sit with that a minute. What you're thinking and you're putting on your breath and out of your mouth is either hurting or helping the whole of creation. When kindness is offered, there's more kindness on the planet, yes? When compassion is offered, there's more compassion available to the one who is expressing the compassion because the bank account has now been given a deposit of compassion and kindness. And that feels really good. But the reality is what we teach in unity, it's not just the good thoughts. It's, it's every thought that you're holding, every feeling that you have is making a deposit into the collective consciousness. It's putting God into play for everyone else to experience the energy of God that does not interfere with your process. That's what unity teaches. Careful what you're thinking. Careful what thought you're putting behind the breath that you just took and the breath that you just put out. Pay close attention to what you're putting into play with the last breath you just took. The spiritual law is working. That's what unity teaches. If you want more love in your life, what's the antidote? Give more love away. If you're experiencing negativity in your life, take a look at the energy that you're putting behind your 30,000 breaths a day. What is the energy and the words that you're entertaining here, the feelings you're entertaining here, and the actions, because your breath is amplifying it. That's what God does. As the breath, it amplifies, it increases, and there's more. Be careful what you think. Each breath is depositing energy into a great cosmological bank account, which is the connection of all creation. Past, present, future, black, white, no matter your religion, we're sharing the same air. We're sharing the same breath. And we can make regular withdrawals because we are making conscious regular deposits. Yes? Say that with me. I'm making conscious deposits. I'm... Our words are lifted and carried by the breath, and they're writing the story of our lives, of our walk on planet Earth, individually and collectively. In many creation stories, the word is considered that divine impulse, the origin of all life. In the beginning was the word. In many creation stories, that is the same idea that is shared in the book of Genesis. The Word is a catalyst, the power to manifest what has previously only been imagined in mind. The breath and the Word and the feelings behind that are manifesting the life we have, we experience, and we know. Everything was created twice. That's why there's two creation stories. It was first created here, then it was created out here. When something is spoken and given breath, it becomes real. Now, words are magic. Would you agree? Words are magic. Remember the magic word abracadabra? Abracadabra, a magician would wave his wand and something would appear or something would disappear. It's important to look what abracadabra really means. It has roots in the ancient Hebrew language, in the ancient Aramaic language. Anybody know what abracadabra actually means? It means I create as I speak. I create as I speak on the breath. The words that are coming out of my mouth are creating the world we live in. Unity is all about speaking, thinking, acting, and breathing with a magical awareness, a mystical awareness that we're all part of a singularity and that we are co-creating together. Hallelujah is good. I remember the first time somebody taught me that, that we're all creating together. I'm responsible for my life. It was not hallelujah. It was holy crap. <laughs> but it becomes a hallelujah when we realize how powerful we are, how we can elicit change on the planet, how we can be the change we want to see. Take another deep breath. Let it go. Use that breath wisely. Because you're creating something. What we're creating today are bridges of understanding between faith traditions. Who's going to go next? I'm going to let Chica go next to speak about African traditions and religions. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm from Nigeria. And um, my tribe, it's a small tribe. It's called Igbo. And we're in the southeastern part of Nigeria. Our faith 
We call it Odinana, which translates to as it is on the earth, like laws of the land. Our faith isn't separate from our culture or tradition, or there's no separate religion. We live our spirituality on the daily. So in everything we do, we carry our spirit. We believe in the one God, and we connect to God through our ancestors. We believe that our ancestors that have walked the planet before us, while they no longer have their uh, physical bodies, they're now closer to God, but they're still connected to us. And so by connecting to them and talking to them and maintaining relationships with them, they essentially serve as our intercessors to God. Uh, a faith is really based around community and everything you're doing relates to the community as we're all children of the ancestors. Science tells us we all have one similar ancestor. So when you interact with another person, you're essentially paying honor, like when you're positively interacting with someone, you're honoring the ancestors by bringing love and kindness to everything around you, people, animals, the earth, and yeah. So let me ask you a question, Chica. So what you're saying is that we are interconnected with not just the others in the room, but with all life, with all creatures, four-legged, the furry, the trees, the leaves, the fauna, all of it is a part of a great unity, yes? Absolutely. And when I'm interacting with you, and we're exchanging ideas, we are interacting as one, right? Yes. So old thought or new thought? Hmm, you decide. It's been around a lot longer than unity. Avril. I was being polite and turned it off in between. <laughs> There's so much overlap. We really um, discovered how beautiful that the synergy was in the first service. And to connect with what Chica says about the ancestors in my tradition, which is the Himalayan tradition, I am remiss to say the word Hinduism because that is really a more modern word. It's an exonym, which means it's a word that was given to the people from outside of the people. And prior to more recent history, you might have lived somewhere on the Indian subcontinent and saw the divine expressing in numerous different deities, but no one felt that they had the, the one right central deity. There was an understanding that if the infinite is infinitely intelligent, it can infinitely express in infinite ways. And so you might have thought of Shiva as your central deity, or you might have thought as Vishnu, but you wouldn't have thought the other person was wrong. So that being said, I prefer to be described as a yogini who practices the Himalayan tradition. In our tradition, we believe in the idea of reincarnation, that it takes many, many lifetimes for you to, to wake up fully and to, to live out your story. But if you listen to what Chica said, it's very similar because I am genetically the people that came before me. So I am reincarnating in my, in my offspring, in my families. And reincarnation doesn't have to be somebody comes that are like this brand new soul. It's, it's all of us continuing this wave of forward motion to connect with what unity believes. And I always like to reference the fact that the Fillmores were influenced by Thoreau and Emerson and the Transcendentalists who were studying yogic and Buddhist philosophy. So we are practicing my tradition in a modern incarnation. But Richard spoke about the word, and before that he intoned the great mantra of my tradition, Om. And Om is our representation of that, that cosmic sound. It's the sound of the waking. It's the sound of the dreaming. It's the sound of the deep sleep. And it's the sound of the transcendent, which expresses as every single one of us. We begin to draw bridges and parallels. One of the things that we talked about last week, and it's obvious in the room today as well, with the Sufi, the Baha'i, the African traditions, and the Himalayan traditions, there's been colonialism. Oh, people that 
have a different way of thinking, and actually what you comment about is you're bad, this is right. Your deity is bad, mine is the right one. And colonial people, I, I said the Abrahamic traditions, but they corrected me last, last service. But people come into a foreign land or a country, and they, they put their blanket over and try to erase. I would be curious if the two of you could speak about um, how you diff deal with the difficulty of, even to this day, there are people that will tell you that your tradition is wrong and that theirs is right. How does, how does your particular culture deal with that, past, present, and in the future? I'm asking them questions that are not on the sheet, so they're, they're going, uh-oh. And he keeps doing that. He did that last service, too. <laughs> A pop quiz. <laughs> um, so our, um, our faith is very inclusive. We believe in the one God. And um, when people come to us, like when I meet somebody, I know that you're my brother and my sister because we all share similar ancestors. This is actually why the um, colonial people and their agenda were able to, I guess, infiltrate because it's that same story of like, we're all talking about the one God, except maybe now stop talking about your ancestors and only talk about, you know, um, our part. But it really is, um, it's beautiful to see today in modern time, I've met people that have found a way to combine it because it's not Jesus versus your ancestors, it's Jesus and your ancestors. Like there's all the different forces um, and all the different spirits in the higher realms that look out for us. And it's like the more the merrier, really. So could it be possible that we could not just say Jesus, uh, it could be Jesus as your ancestor, yeah. that this interrelated interconnectedness, and I, that's something we teach in unity, is some of us have been hurt by orthodox religion. We've been hurt and injured and have scars, yet we will not ever give up the, the view and the truth, the spiritual truth, that we belong to each other. So it's a both and, it's not an either or reality. We just don't play the game that colonialism wants to play, we allow ourselves to go to a deeper place and a higher vibration to connect and find oneness. And I love that you shared that. You know, as you study the history of India, it was the original interfaith melting pot. And there was a time, and I'm not saying it's expressing that way now, but there was a time where you might decide as a, a Buddhist emperor like Ashoka, to still pay homage to Hindu deities and to still allow the freedom of practice of the Muslims who were living there on the subcontinent. It just wasn't seen as a, as a threat because everybody understood that the spirit was about spirit. It wasn't about conquest. Um, now we have terms even in India like orthodox and and non-Orthodox. And that's really something that has been absorbed more recently. But yoga, my tradition, is another way of describing it, is to Hinduism what Sufism is to Islam and what unity is to Christianity. It's about the mystical experience. It's about the direct experience of the divine as opposed to the mere concept of God. Like I'm thinking about God and God is this thing out there. This is a way of thinking about, not even thinking about because it's beyond thought. It's about living that God is you incarnate. Sounds like unity, a lot. Yes? So let me ask a question um, of the two of you, and this is on your list. I hope you're ready for it. What does your faith teach about working with people of different faith traditions and culture, in particularly with destructive behaviors? So how does your faith deal with what the world would call violent and destructive behaviors? It's rampant in our world today, tearing things down. How, would you, how do you deal with that from your faith perspective? So um, there's different levels of destructive behavior. Um, and really, when you look at things from the perspective of we are all from, like we're all one and we're all from the land and we all have similar ancestors. If, as a mother, if someone hurt my child, they're hurting me. So when you do something destructive to a person in your community, you're hurting the divine because 
it's all one body that we're living. Unity, we say often in unity, there is no private good and there is no private suffering. If we are interconnected, that which is being done is affecting the whole and the scars are shared amongst us. Avril? Ekam sat vipra bahuda vadanti. There is a single truth, but the wise call it by different names. And that is from the Rig Veda, which is from 3000 plus BCE. Um, in our tradition, there is no other. I just, I can't say that enough different ways. If I hurt Richard, I'm just flatly hurting myself. And the idea is that to take that from this conceptual thing when we're contemplating that, and we, that's actually part of our practice. We sit and contemplate that I am everyone else. I am everyone else. I am everyone else. And we call that mere, M-E-R-E, -E, knowledge. But then there comes a time when we begin to experience that, where you're walking around and you're like, wait a minute, I'm looking at myself. And that's the experiential. So we have a tenet called ahimsa, which means non-violence, loosely translated. But the origin of it, himsa, means just to actually push. And it's the idea that you're that we walk around going like this against others, even, you know, like people call it microaggression and stuff now, but even the thought that I think that you are outside of me creates a push. And so one of the practices to constantly contemplate that you and I are just one being looking through a, a bunch of different eyes. And then if I really embody that, how, how can I be an instrument of harm? And when I think that I've harmed, what can I do to ameliorate that harm? Because we all, we all miss the mark, right? And so that's where things like in this tradition, classically, we work on making amends. And, and uh, that's, that's the Gandhiist idea of nonviolence at its core comes from there's nobody outside of myself. So old thought, new thought, you decide. Or maybe old thought revisited. We say in, in, in our tradition, we quote the master teacher Jesus, pay unto Caesar what is Caesar's. There's going to be consequences for evil acts here on earth. You're going to have to be held accountable to your actions on earth, but pay unto God what is God's, which means never give up. Even if you have been harmed by somebody, never give up the ability to, to find and look beneath the surface to the love, to the good that might be right there and that has been missed by somebody. Don't be among those who are missing the good. Operate at a higher place and a higher vibration. Kindness, compassion, love. And when you say that, Richard, you know, you, you said pay on to Caesar, pay on to God. And even that can sound a little dualistic. Like if we have something happen because of choices that have been made from thousands and thousands of years ago, it's punishment. But there's nobody outside punishing us. And I think all of our traditions subscribe that things like karma aren't because we're, we were bad and we're being spanked by the cosmic two by four. No, we're yes. being spanked by our own laws. The laws set up on earth, there's going to be consequences. You act a certain way, you have a certain consequence. When I run the red light, I'm going to get a ticket. Or an accident. Yeah, and that's, that's a real minor way to look at it. But there's some people sitting in this room that have had some really horrible things happen to you. It wasn't a God that made them happen or directed you. But that person who did that to you was going to pay prices. But our job, and it is the hardest part of a Unity student, is I will never give up the ability to look with spiritual eyes to see where did they forget what pain were they in that they could cause such horrible things? I have to find the oneness. It's not an easy task. None of these, these uh, jobs are easy, but they are essential to healing the planet that we live on. I would love to ask you, what is the ultimate purpose of your faith? What is the reason for your faith tradition? Um, I think it's really community, connecting to the, the vine through community. You know, whatever um, gift you're given when you come into this uh, realm, it's not your gift. It's a gift that you're given to serve the community. And truly, that's how you become um, an ascended ancestor, an ancestor that people want to make an altar for and remember, is that you've come and you've given your gift to humanity and you've shared your gift and that truly is the purpose. And you're essentially never alone because you're one of, you're one link, or one thread in the web of everything. So whatever, when you're suffering, when you're celebrating, you're tied to a community that's experiencing 
life with you. What I love about um, the teachings and my tradition is that there is absolutely a definitive point to it, where I think sometimes people walk around and they have a life where they're, you know, they, they are this religion or that religion because that's what was given to them. And it might be a nice thing, but I love that this has a definitive waking state of consciousness, that there is the whole point of these practices is to self-realize, to wake up, to shed the illusion of separation, to step from the mere conceptual talk about it to being in a state of enlightenment. And I have a beautiful quote on enlightenment. Enlightenment is a state of freedom from the ignorance that causes suffering. And attaining this is the prime necessity of every human life. There is no necessity to attain mere belief in God, but it is necessary to have profound knowledge of the truth which lies beyond the concept of the word God. And that's from Swami Rama from Enlightenment Without God. So why unity? You got a different faith tradition. You know, we're all looking around the room. There's as many faith path, spiritual paths in this room as there are people. Uh, what is it about being at unity? I know it's not on the, it's not on the paper. <laughs> More pop quizzes. <laughs> they're, they're, not, they're wanting to throw that mic at me right now. You, end, you ended up here as a, an active participant in a unity church. How, how, do, you, how do you juxtapose the, your particular faith with what unity is teaching? I, I'm going to answer that one hardcore. So, first of all, there's the whole karma and ancestors thing, and we were having a chat before service about how I am 50% Nigerian, whether or not my parents are aware of it, but that is what our 23andMe genes say, okay? <laughs> and our ancestors were brought, you know, on forced migration. They were of the enslaved and ended up in the deep south in Jamaica and Barbados in Trinidad, because that's the south. Actually, Brazil is the deep south. And then my ancestors went to Panama to build the canal, and ultimately my mother and father made their way to New York. But when you do my 23andMe, it's 75% West African and 25% British and Irish. You can figure out how that happened. Okay. So sitting here with her, understanding the karma of my ancestors, and my mother, who was an early adopter of unity with Carol when they were in the shopping center. So my karmic wave sweeps me to unity. Subsequently, at the, mean, at the same time, I'm living in an ashram in upstate New York, meditating and chanting. My parents were always so open and cool to exploration. That's just who they are as people. I'm lucky. I got, I got lucky in the cosmic dice roll. I had parents who were like, hey, whatever you believe is good, and there's many ways to do this. So when my mother and father were coming here, I wanted a home. My ashram and my teachers were, lived, were far away. They were in India, they were in Florida and upstate New York. And I wanted a place that I could hang out in community. And as I started to come, I was like, oh wow, they're just saying the same things. Our place is pluralistic, this is pluralistic. That's why I'm here. So, we, I know we are related because uh, my 23 and me is 100% British and Irish. So you are my and sister. I yes. always knew it, my sister. These are my, my family members here. How cool is that? Unfortunately, my parents are devout atheists. They don't believe in God, and they think that this is all a waste of time. But I found it for the same reasons. Find the door that there's a sense of belonging, a sense of community, a sense of we're all having a common vision and a common purpose, and that is the oneness of all people. Chica. That's so beautiful. Um, so the first time I came to Unity, um, I sat somewhere around there, and I, Reverend Richard was praying, and he said, um, in reference to God, he said, he, she, it. And I was like, this is my church. Yeah. <laughs> because for me, as, as I've journeyed through, like, I'm, I consider myself an explorer, um, you know, I was raised Catholic, spent my summers with nuns, so very, very Catholic. And um, at some point through my journey, I discovered meditation and yoga, and then later um, more of my traditional religion. And I haven't quite seen a contradiction with them. They're all saying the same thing. They're all saying this oneness, and they just offer different perspectives to connect with God. And I believe much like if, 
if you wanted to get to know me and you spoke to my sister, she would offer a perspective of me. And if you also spoke to my husband and my son and my mother and father, you would get a way better perspective of me. And I believe that's the same with God. Like when you talk to other people and you hear other people's perspectives of God, it gives you a fuller picture. So when I showed up in unity and we're not just talking about God as a he, we're also exploring the perspective of she and it and really just everything. That's been, I was like, this is where I'm meant to be. And it's true. We like to, to joke in unity that if you want to have an opinion about me, there can be 300 people from Unity North in the room and there'll be 303 opinions about who I am. But the reality is what we, we share is a diamond. We use the analogy of a diamond. It's one diamond, but it's multifaceted. The light hits that diamond and it, it, it shoots out, rays, all different ways of expression. But it's one cause. It's the light. And that's what we share. So we ask the question, old thought or new thought, it's all just thought. It's all just truth. It's all spiritual reality. And it's our job as Unity students to follow the path that leads us to the light, but leads us back to the one diamond, to the one source, and to realize that we cannot and never will be separate from each other.